uh, so I, yeah, it's recording now. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. All right, well, I'll just start it out then. Okay. Okay. Greetings one and all here for another edition, Corey Harris with Five Points International, African movers and shakers from around the world. Thank you all. If this is your first time coming to the video, to the channel, please like, share, and subscribe. If you smash that like button, smash the like button so we can get more views on YouTube. That's gonna help us out immensely. Thank you all very much. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome the good brother, Brother X, coming to us from South Africa. How you doing, brother? I'm good, my brother, and you? Just I'm checking. doing wonderful. I'm glad we finally linking. All the time, I'm grateful too. Yes, give thanks, give thanks. So uh, for those um, who are unfamiliar with your works, maybe you can give a, a short introduction and, and let the people know what you what you are uh, dealing with. Yeah, my name is Olile Matinda, uh, but most people call me X uh, because um, most people, you know, may find it easy to call me by that. Uh, because I used to rap, my rap name was X Nasty. So as I grew up, people prefer to call me X because my real name, Olile, starts with an X, like X O L E L I. Yeah. X O L I L E. Yes. That's how it Olile means at peace. So basically, um, uh, as we speak right now, I'm outside the Black Power Station which is, uh, is a nice space, but you would see, um, if you check to my channel, basically we're an arts uh, space, but not limited to arts. We are creatives trying to stimulate the mind of people using the arts as the basis, you know, to dismantle some certain behaviors. So you are in Makanda live, um, outside in the so-called industrial area of this place, um chatting with me in the place called black power station we do performances we do book reading we do anything that gets people together to actually deal with other issues that they wish to deal with but in a more safer space so basically um that's a rough brief of what i do as a person but i can say i'm a person who wants to heal the broken society we inherited after apartheid. Uh -huh. Powerful, yes. Well, um, what sort of issues are y'all dealing with? You mentioned the issues. Tell us what the issues are in contemporary South Africa that we need to know about. Um, well, we abstract how we deal with these issues because we know uh, the mind is an abstract thing to deal with, you know but you have to find and crack some of the foundations that were built to, to construct um, confusion in the mind of young people, whether you're white or black. But, um, but firstly, we try to deal with the issues of identity, but in a more creative way, and to just make young people to, to understand who they are and the value in the community, because you realize young people in any way in the world, you find them sitting in the corners with amounts of skills they, they have with them, but they be sitting in a corner, which can make them victims of other people who have agendas to use them in any other means to make themselves uh, richer mm -hmm. or maybe whatever to continue with whatever they're doing. So we try to, to tackle the mind, you know, by, by, by increasing the the consciousness of the people. Like for an example, we use Leek, Steve Leeko's books as ways of actually making young people to understand. And because Leeko is from the Eastern Cape where we are, and Leeko has many visited times here in Makanda uh, during his time as a student and during his time of activism. So he has some history here with people in this city so in a way we use his book, I Write What I Like as a way to interrogate some of the ideas of how the mind has been shackled, which shackles in the mind without people, the, visible, the invisible shackles. So the concept of identity, your well-being 
uh, not your well-being in terms of the wealth, but your your mental state and understanding your condition and how you get out in the condition. So we use hip hop, we use theater, we use visual art, we paint the streets, we do murals. So we do many things that are closer to the young people that also breaks the stereotype that already exists in the community. Like for an example, specifically now, before we charted, we busy with a conversation uh, about the uh, Makanda. The city has been renamed because it was used to be called Grahamstown and people can Google this history. And now is the government has uh, been trying to find a way to change the name because it's issues, you know, with the, how the history has been placed. So the town is named Makanda after one of the warriors who resisted and fought against the system at their time, you know. So now we are doing a production called The Lost Conversation. So The Lost Conversation is, um, is based on trying to take history and use our own imagination of that time and try to take some of the topics that we, we thought or we think that the people dealt with at that time. Like for an example, people are saying a lot of things about the, how the war was. We're not interested in the physical war. We're interested about the arguments and the lobbying that was happening before the war that Makanda had to deal with. What were the conditions before the war? What was he thinking? Who did he lobby to join him? You know, so the play we are having now, the episode we're dealing with is between a missionary, a Christian man and, and Makanda trying mm -hmm. to deal with the situation of like the church trying to silence um, Makanda from actually planning the war. So the conversation mm. is between these two men, I mean, these three men, which are having a conversation based on why they have to deal with the war, why they have to fight. You know, the fight is not the physical fight. The fight is the actual, the mental fight of you have to fight so the next generation doesn't have to be slaved. So the next mm -hmm. generation, if you, even if you lose the war, the intention is that you fight the war so that people can talk about it. So that the next generation, you could breed a new generation of fighters. So the war mm -hmm. continuously happen for generation and generation. So if you mm -hmm. submit, then you're gonna breed a generation of young people who will submit. So we're trying to play around with, with this theme of the last conversation about some conversation that might have happened and some of them mm -hmm. might never happened. But for us, we're constructing that conversation using Makanda at that time as a subject but dealing with current issues. So we're trying to say that with art, you can do that. Like in most American films, you would see how they will reenact a film about the president and they can put it in any context which they like. So why as Africans, we can't do that and put our own agenda in our own leaders at the present time, but deal with the past and see how these two things link. So we use using culture and we're using how religion place itself on top of the culture. While the religion was supported, uh, the Christian religion was supported by the system when they're oppressing and the system crushed the African religion and the systems of people, how they govern themselves. So all that system was oppressed because of the religion, of the war and all these things. So young people, how would they relate to the past and acknowledge that they had heroes who meant well for this generation? You know, because we are left with the with the ignorant mindset that our elders before us didn't leave us any inheritance. They left us, they left us as slaves. Even across the world where black people are, they feel that our forefathers they didn't fight the good fight, they lost. But actually that's not true for me. And that's what we wanna portray in this conversation here at the Black Power Stage by saying, they've won the fight. The reason that there were a group of people who fought, but that group of people who fought 
has bred generations that are us, which we're fighting in a different way because the fight was mental. Because the fight before you use your limbs, it has to be mental first. So now we have to deal with the mental, make the mental far sharp and wiser to understand that our forefathers left us with the history and the land, you know? Mm -hmm. So we have to understand that we have a journey to learn. We have to unlearn and relearn our own ways of life. So the Black Power Station is dealing with concepts like that, using mm -hmm. art and history and, you know, many other things that um, for us young people to carry with us to the future. I don't mm -hmm. know if you're making sense. No, you're making very good sense, brother. Yeah, and um, as you're talking, you know, it's uh, stimulating my mind and making me think about a lot of things, you know. Um, you mentioned, first of all, just to put it in the historical context, you mentioned the war. What uh, years are we talking about this war? Yo, it's, it's very long. If I can run quick, if you don't mind, um, I'll pick up the book. So just to show that, um, what we're dealing with. Do you mind if I do that? No problem. Okay, I'll be fast, very fast, I promise. Okay, okay, no problem. Yes, well, while we're on this break, just wanna let you all know we are here with Five Points International in conversation with the Black Power Station with Brother X. And I became acquainted with the good brother not too long ago, a few weeks ago, of course, on Zoom. That's how a lot of these things happen nowadays, as you know. And I was immediately impressed by his revolutionary commitment, his artistry, and the way that he welds the two together to serve his community. So that's what we're dealing with right now, talking to the Black Power Station. As you can see, there's some trees behind there with leaves on them. They're in the Southern Hemisphere, so they have a summertime right now. So yeah, here with the Black Power Station. And again, I want to remind you all to please like, share, and subscribe. Uh, help us to get this video out on YouTube, of course. And you can find the Black Power Station on Facebook. Um, you can search them on Facebook, Black Power Station or also around Hip Hop Live Cafe. Yes, sir. Yes. <laughs> All right, welcome back, brother. Yeah, sorry for that, you know. No worries. Um, basically, um, we've been playing with the, we didn't reference a lot from the book. There's a book written by one of the historians in town, Julie Wells. So it's around the, the story of Makanda, you know, mm -hmm. as the Tosa leader, but the history, and the war what happened around 1819. Mm -hmm. So that's the mm -hmm. year the war happened. So mm -hmm. playing around these ideas of this book, this one, so, so basically we're playing around with these ideas, but in a more creative way, because we know there's, there, according to history, there's a history that is written in books. There's a history that is told for generations from families around. Since the war happened in this city, obviously there be stories for generation and generation. And these stories, we try to foster them in the current politics because as the people ourselves, these are not just stories who will last only in books. These are the stories who continue you know, happening and they take different shape for every generation and for every season. So for mm -hmm. our season, um, for the story of Makanda from 1819 to 20, from 2020 to 2021 and beyond, we have to deal with this history of Makanda in a very different way, but being persistent mm -hmm. and, 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 and precise on actually getting our minds back. So that's the mm -hmm. whole idea of the Black Power Station. How do we get our minds back to ourselves? Mm -hmm. We have our bodies, but our bodies mm -hmm. are not connecting with our souls and to our, with the land and everything else. So we're using the arts to bring those back 
consulting mm -hmm. with the elderly in the community, consulting mm -hmm. with the books, even critically with the books because they might lead us astray, you know, so we are very critical even of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as you were speaking, you know, it made me think about something in, in general in societies that have been colonized in one way or another or oppressed through slavery or what have you. Yeah. There's often um, the, uh, the conflict between those in power who view history as a linear phenomenon, yeah. meaning that, okay, that happened back then and now we here today. So let's just forget about all that and move forward, you know, but as I'm listening to you speak your truth, I'm aware of the reality that in the African world, history is a current event. Yes. You know, everything that happened is still happening and, and is something that is a living thing. Yes. You know, like I've heard people say many times, we are our ancestors, yeah. you know, and they are us, you know. So it's very inspiring to hear you talk about using the history in service to the community to let the youth know about their identity. Yeah, to, to add on what you're saying, you know, um, uh, like, rest in peace to my father, but he always say that there's these two things that always fight, which is the past and the present. They always want to be having their cells being represented all the time. Because for an example, Right now we're talking about the past. Once we invoke that history, it wants to be present. It wants to assume its position. If you want, so, and then these two, the past itself is a problem, like problems of racism, problems of people being killed. So that means you need to acknowledge what happened in the past and how you learned that. And that past would want to exist in present time because some of the people will would embody that, you know? And how you embody that history and that reality of that history is very important. That's why the mind must be ready for that. So the past and the present will always conflict with each other. So most people who know the past will always want you to forget, but naturally you won't forget because you are, you are born of the land. The land will remind you because the land is the one that carries, holds the, the history. People like archaeologists have testimony to this, but they don't want to connect the soul to the land. They always connect like dead things, like, oh, we find a structure. That's what they want us to look at as the past. And they want us to remember that part and put those things in a museum. But they don't want to connect reality and soul and people with what they find in whatever wherever they go so meaning that whoever tells anyone to forget it means that person has power to understand if you start to know it's like if we should forget about the past why are we not told to forget our parents <laughs> because there are people who brought us to life and now we're independent people why should we consider them part of our lives? Why should mm -hmm. we have, why should we say there's a, there's a history? So that history is not far, it what's, it's what makes us. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I guess for me, what, I, in the, in the Zamuicho, what I'm trying to say is that these two realities, the past and the present, they will always contest each other because one wants to dominate. Mm -hmm. So now, it's like the balance will only happen when people know who they are. So when past wants to dominate, you are in present, part of the past, transform spiritually. You need to be able to say, yes, the past did this to my people. This won't happen. So I have the ammunition of the past to protect myself and acknowledge those forefathers who brought this life to me. Because mm -hmm. if I call who I am, then why should I acknowledge those people? So mm -hmm. why should I forget them? Mm -hmm. it means that I must say, I just pop up from nowhere. And that's not true. 
nothing happens like that there's no such thing you know so in a way i we 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 are contested with those two realities the past and the present who always want to fight clench mm-hmm. each other but if you someone who knows you who you are you at peace with these things when they want to fight you can say wait let's deal with it without fighting but i will fight what wants to oppress what happened in the past because that mm-hmm. makes who i am and what mm-hmm. will happen in the future is me understanding this part of my life so i can walk and not fumble in the world you understand so mm-hmm. i guess that's the, that's the reality is that um we have to fight these ideas hard with no mercy mm-hmm. hmm. no mercy is right you know yeah because for example you know in the united states the mantra is always saying you know like like i said before well slavery for example was so long ago they'll say yet they'll do a remembrance on september 11th every year for the world trade center and they'll always say never forget mm. you know and that was that was very recent that was like it could have been last week it was so recent you know so it's uh it's amazing the contradiction but you 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 laid it out plain for the people i appreciate that so how now does the music come into play how does the hip hop come into play as far as what you do on the day to day basis with the youth to impart these these important lessons uh let me yeah hip hop is part of it because myself I was influenced by it but it's not the fundamental it's one of the art forms of music that actually comes up front um there there's some of the arguments we have with friends here that um you know in hip hop there these genres in south africa we say like conscious cats you know they want to want to speak conscious rhymes you know you know they're boring but for me personally i think i was conscious before hip hop is hip hop just endorsed i found artists who were endorsing whatever that i was believing in because i my uncle alesta may so rest in peace when he found out that i was rapping he didn't like it because we was more in the black consciousness movement at the time of big and then so he heard that was rapping run about 1996 and then he said to me he gave me books time longer than a rope uh books you know black consciousness material and he said mm-hmm. read this because i don't want you to be americanized you know mm-hmm. this thing of hip hop so you're going to sound american you're going to forget your heritage and whatever so but what was nice about the conversation between me and him is someone i respected so for him to not say i must stop but i will only stop if i don't reflect who i am i must not create a world that is artificial to me yes i can visualize the future and critique the system at the time but i must be I'm conscious of my community and who I am. So I started writing more in Kosa so that the people can hear what I'm saying because um what's the point of getting in front of audience and rap and get all those punchlines and get applauded and talk about the system but I'm not part of making the change. So mm-hmm. so the book that he gave me I write what I like, you know, and other books that he kept on giving me were more like like something that i was loving because it was more like um a testimony like there's a part in me that says black man you're on your own so if you're on your own it means you must create a system that balances you that protects you so i started writing rap we started organizing with friends so everyone who has any type of music our traditional music is not suppressed by the new way of us expressing ourselves which is hip hop dominantly hip hop and there are people who are imbongi which is you would call them uh, poets you know so there's culture that exists but that gets fused in to hip hop 
So it's not one way, you know. So you would find friends of mine who are Rastas, you find friends of mine who are Muslim, you find friends of mine who are Christian, you find friends of mine who are strictly African religion. They don't want to deal with any like any Western or any other domination that suppresses African ways of life. So so the music is always coming from these waves, but um it's all about trying to express, you know, so basically it's not only hip hop, but it comes in more influence. It's the most, it's the most thing that you will see more here. You know, it's music because it's accessible. People can write rap by themselves. It, it needs you. You are the first instrument before you mm -hmm. ask your friend to do beats. You the first instrument because you have to write, use your mouth. So you, consider yourself as the first instrument. So I guess that's why it's easy and accessible because it starts with you. Mm -hmm. True. <laughs> yeah, it definitely starts starts with us in general. That's where it has to be. Um, so yeah, you know, um, I'm invited to hear you talk about two great warriors. You mentioned some about Makanda and then Stephen Biko who many of the people I'm sure know about. Um, but tell us, tell us um, a little bit, please, about the history of the warrior Makanda and that story. Well, I'll tell it according to my liking. <laughs> um, there are books, you know, people can read. I can refer the book. I think this, I think the book, is, it is online to get the one that is written by Julie Wells. Um, but the history of Makanda, he, he was uh, a brief view. I wouldn't say history, a brief view of, yeah. of what I like about Makanda and how his stories, you know, is told around. He was this person who was a poet, partly his life was also a poet. He was in Bondi, I praise poet, and he was also a, um, a healer. So with all these skills, and then he was once in his life Christianized, and he was a Christian, and he was fluent in Dutch. So this man, according to the angle that I'm enjoying, is that he, he saw the injustice that happened to his people with all this knowledge, because you can't be fluent in Dutch and be into a Christian religion and know your, cause you grew up from your own culture. You know, you know these both worlds. So there's a, there's a chance of you having conflict with yourself because you understand yourself, you understand what has been introduced to you. So what has been introduced to you, if it doesn't accommodate who you grew up with, is either you discard one or the, you learn to incorporate two, both of them. So I think what happened to Makanda, he realized if he's in the community of what he's indoctrinated to, but this doesn't benefit his own people. So he went back to his own people and he was embraced by the community and he started resistance to fight about the land because he realized the system at that time that was oppressive was trying to take the land and take the way of people how they think so that's what drives me and interested of the character makanda because the reality is whatever you get introduced in must never oppress your own people it must actually add on to your people because you come from people so whatever you get out there must be able to an addition to your people not subtract, not take away, because once you take away, you mean that generation and generation will be poor. So I think for what I take from Makanda, and then briefly what the sto story about him, he goes to this war, it was a bloody one, where there are stories, because the history is written, it's a closer. And then for me, some of the stuff I hear in the book, don't settle well with me. Not because I want a nice history on Makanda, no. But 
I have a problem when it's written in English, written by people who, who didn't speak Isikosa. Like there's a part that actually makes me more reason why I should be doing this play called The Lost Conversation, is that there's a part they say about Makanda. Makanda did lie to his people and say the bullets will turn to water. So they should go to war and not worry. My saying is this when I had with my father when he was alive, I said, do you think someone who, who lived with the Christian people lived at that time, at the current time, do you think he would be dumb enough to not understand what, because first they were not using bullets then, they were using powder. So, so now, why are they writing and say bullets will turn to water? But at that time they were using powder, right? So, so my father says, no, remember, it's the only way to make you think less of your people who fought for you. Because my father says to me, what if Makanda was saying, don't be afraid. We'll call on upon the powers and the ancestors to bring rain to us. So if it rains, the powder won't be effective as it should be when there's no rain. Meaning that they'll be slower when there's rain. It's for us, we must, the weather is gonna be good for us. So let's not fear, let's go for it. And the powder will be delayed because of the rain. Mm -hmm. so that moment in my life turned around and said, yes, this is what he was saying because I can testify to this because part of the story of Makanda during the war, they say there was this woman when the powder on that side was finished because the Kosa warriors would not touch a woman. So the woman would be taken away during war. So the, what they did, the, the, the people who were fighting with Makanda, they, they asked the woman to act like he's, she's carrying a baby. So the closer warrior stopped to allow the white woman to pass. What they didn't realize this woman was carrying powder because those people ran out of powder. So that part alone of that transition of that woman being allowed to allowed to pass, it shows how respect we had for women, whether they were white or black. So that woman passed, they even made a statue in town of this woman, I will take a picture of you sometime. Of this woman, where they have her with, a, with, with a, something resembling the powder that she was carrying. But that statue is being demolished. Some kids are actually messing it up, which I don't have a problem with it. But for mm -hmm. historical purposes, it would be nice for people to see the resembles of that. But for me, it's no harm. So because that's not history of my people, but it is about portion of my history. So in a way to show that the mercy that people were having, it was based on a conflict because they would have killed that poor woman, but they stopped. So now coming back to my, my, my point of saying that Makanda, if he said bullets will turn, if he said um, powder, will turn to water is true because soil or anything powderish, when it rains, it disappears. So for me, that's the proof that sometimes our history is told to defeat us. How it's written, it's written to defeat us so we can doubt ourselves. So to show now, how do we fight this history with our current times is to interrogate the language how it was written and the context of that time. So for me, Makanda was one of those warriors who knew these different worlds. And the reason why he made that statement is because he knew those people. So he wasn't dumb enough. He was, he was clever enough actually to understand that world because he lived there. So he, he understood like, ah, me and you right now, if there could be war, we would know what ammunition to use to fight against our enemy. You know, there's nothing said about the war of Makanda maybe stealing some of the ammunition on that side because they were current. It was not something foreign to them, the way the machine they were using. So 
You know, these people settle first before fighting. So are you trying to tell me there was no understanding to each other? So we're trying to interrogate these ideas using this history. So Makanda was that person who fought and in the middle of a war, he started, apparently they captured him. He went to Nigoti and they captured him and they took him to Robben Island, you know, where in Cape Town, where the island. So they took him to Robben Island and then they was part of the, or the first people to be kept there before Mandela time, you know? So, because people they talk about Robben Island as only the time, but there's a lot of people who were kept in Robben Island before even Makanda. There were people who were kept there. So basically Makanda was one of the slaves and the heroes and the people who fought in the war was kept there in Robben Island. And there's a story now saying the coming of Makanda because Makanda tries several times to escape. And there's one moment they say that he escaped but never was found. So now there's a, there's a, there's a, a story similar to the story of Jesus, the coming of Makanda because the, he was not re finished with the war. So the story that say Makanda, you know, people used to call him Mele. Uh, Nele is a name, but also it's like left and right. Your left is 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 Lingele, really cautious. So basically, Nele they called him Nele. I don't know if he was more left-handed, you know. I don't know, but they called him Nele. Uh, so they say Ukubuya Guga Nele, the coming of Makanda. So that is always being the story told. So now, for me, what makes me interested in the story of Makanda. We currently, the town is named after Makanda. Maybe he has returned, you know, mm. in us naming the town after him. But what happens is our conscious to continue the fight he was fighting, but smarter. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah, rich legacy, man. I love it. I love it. It's very interesting. That's something I didn't hadn't heard of before. Yeah. So now, um, you mentioned Biko as well. What is the role or the inspiration that Biko played in your evolution and in African people in general for those who haven't read any of his works? I've read, I write what I like and I was really, um, I was really struck by his commitment, mm. by his scholarship and his analysis of his situation. True. So maybe you could tell the people the important place that he holds in black politics today. I'll start with me first, because you know, I, I honor things to, to my uncle for introducing me to Biko and to black consciousness, because I think black consciousness as a whole, you know, um, to me, black consciousness is some of my friends, we argue about this. It's it's a it's a way of life. It's being conscious who you are. It's not a political organization. It's being conscious who you are and take your position in the society as a person first. You know, so for me, it was like when I read the works, it was more like a Bible. I was revived spiritually, mentally physically, my surrounding makes sense. Everything started to make sense to understand that you should know yourself so that you can feel confident to take over the world. Because the reason why I think black consciousness played a role to me at that time, I was young, around 16, you know, when I was starting rapping 1996. And, you know, I know 1996, I was not 16, but 1996, it was a time for me when the awakening of my conscious reading those material, because mm -hmm. what Biko meant, it was like black men, you own your own. And I was, we were staying in a township of Fingo. Fingo is one of the oldest townships that were structured and people had title deeds because if you entered in a community, we either accepted Christianity, you would find jobs and get education. So it's an old township in that sense because people have title deeds. It was never demolished. 
it's older, but there were people, there were villages before it was made to communities like it is today, townships where like there's houses in the form of churches and stuff. There were communities there, there were villages, but all that was removed and replaced by something else. So we, I come from that community, Fingo, and most of the history told about Biko's um, presence in Makanda was in Fingo. In one of the streets there, apparently used to come in one of the houses um, down where I stay in, in, in my street, he used to come there to have meetings. And then also Makanda, he, used to, he came once as a student, you know, at Rhodes University with his students. And then part of his conviction of being fighting the system was when they came as a student formation with other students who were multiracial from where he was studying. When he came to Rhodes, apparently the argument started about where meeting must be held. And then Biko had an argument, why can't it be held on that side? And then he was reminded that he's black. He was reminded the condition of himself was reminded, not that he was not aware, but because of him questioning that, his position in the organization, he could realize that we need to start our own organization outside the one that is mixed with the whole liberal mindset, whether you have whites and all that. He realized our politics, if we cannot have this conversation or this meeting where other people are, he was reminded that you, you can be in this place, but the society outside of the university, the racism is still real. So he had to, he didn't, they were not allowed to stay at Rhodes University as the black side of the student movement. So they stayed in my community where it's called Fingo. So part of his time being in Fingo at that time is also part of the influence in Biko in my life because that history is told. And then there's something we grew up with. So that motivates us beside reading the book, just knowing that he came here, knowing that he was once arrested coming from Cape Town, arrested here, and he had to confront the, <laughs> the, the white policeman who didn't pronounce his name properly and said, my name is Steven Bantu Biko. So he insisted because the policeman apparently didn't even know Biko. You know, according to the book, when I read it, is is like in the small paragraph, it's in the, they were in a the car, they were asked to go to the police station and then he was asked, who and your name? And the guy who was driving was asked, where are you going? Say, I'm going to King Williamstown. And then, and the policeman said, oh, you're going to visit Biko? He said, no, because Tibiko was, the police were looking for him at that time. Yeah. And the guy said, no, I'm not going to Biko. While Biko is at the back of the car, listening to a radio. And so mm -hmm. when they went to the police station, they asked his name and he said, my name is Stephen Bantu Biko. So he didn't, he didn't say anything else to show that he couldn't hide his identity. You know, he, you know, he spoke out and they arrested him. So I love that story about Bik and the connection of Makanda. So to me, everything I am, I owe it to how he opened up my mind. And more young people today, they are actually emulating this idea from their music, from whatever they do. They know that there is someone there's a group of friends that I joined last year. They called Kids of Biko. You can check them also on, 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 on YouTube, on Instagram. They're also, they're also young people around 18, 21. They're pushing ideas around Biko. You know, they're not even related to Biko, but they, the philosophy, reading the book to them, they construct ideas around how they can be uh, known in the society by reading, you know, this is, it's like, it's an awakening tool. It's like that pill you take. You see in Matrix where they have to choose between the pills. You see like, that's one of the pills they take, the, the right what I like. But obviously there's two genres of reality when people read Biko. You know, um, for students who are reading Biko, they have conflicts in the university space 
Because Migo, there's part he talks about about black students to have their own organization without the influence of white students. So now radical students who would completely take that tone of Miko will be seen as people who don't want to uh, interrogate, I mean, it's democracy in South Africa, so let's all be together. So there will be young people who read Miko and say, Miko said this. And these are the reasons, those realities are still happening today because we marginalize. So our agenda should be only us. So there is still those politics that Miko was addressing in his book about student politics is still existing, even outside of university space, because the exclusion of black people is not just in university space in the whole entire world. So basically people take Miko as a comfort, a space of comfort because um, you hardly hear about Biko in public space because Biko is still considered a radical, you know, but I think he was radical in the way of constructing the brain. Was, I think he didn't have mercy. He was not sugarcoating his, uh, his way. Even one of the classes we did with the students from University of Virginia, UVA, we play the clip where Biko, with the part that is acted by Denzel, where, where Biko is actually having a conversation with the judge, you know, about his position, you know, as, as a black man and, he, and his response show how intelligent Biko was. So young people want to assert themselves to that level of Biko, the level of being able to critically engage with issues. So I guess Miko is a similar to Malcolm X to young people in, in the US. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that could be an easier example of mm -hmm. actually knowing that everything is in here in this muscle and we mm -hmm. have to strain it and stretch it far because so that it can keep on because if it doesn't doesn't get stretched it stays it freezes like a cement that was left outside and gets rained on and it becomes a stone. And then you heat it, it just breaks in pieces. So, but you keep on stretching it, it becomes useful and productive to your body. Yes, indeed. Guess that's how Biko to me was. Uh -huh. Yeah. Oh, powerful. You know, as you were speaking, you invoke um, Malcolm X, your honorable El Haj Malik El Shabazz. You know. And um, makes me think of the shoulders he stood on, namely Marcus Garvey in the UNIA. Yes. And I know through reading that there is a long history of Garveyism yes. in South Africa. So maybe you could speak on that as well. Yes, you know, that has been, I can say, in the, this is what is amazing about art and mostly in hip hop. Because what young people are introduced to these names via the art more than what at home. Because I think our senior citizens are afraid to give us these names and these icons and these people who fought for us. There's Steve Biko, there's Krizani, there's more other people who fought for us. But I think our elderly people are afraid to tell us this history bluntly because they're afraid what we might do because of the condition that we under. So, so the safest space to get this information is via art. You know, because you will, when Biko is addressed to you, when people quote Biko in their raps, people would, find it smooth and, 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 and artistic, but they would want to learn about that. That's how information education has been spread. And then Gavi is been mostly hold stronger by, by, by people who into Rastafarian. Most people like in Cape Town, there's Gavi village where like there's the place called Gavi village where like the rasters, but everyone is welcome. So young people who are into hip hop who go to ciphers because there'll be rasters who rap 
and they will quote Gavi and they would link Rastas with Gavi village. They will link Gavi with the Rastav movement. And then when they realize, when they start reading, because through poetry and hip hop and battles of conscious, people learn pass message to each other. We carry books with our memories, you know? So we carry books, we carry knowledge with our rhymes. So we, we teaching each other. And now when someone goes to a cipher and goes back home and have a conversation with their parents about Nico, it's much easier for the conversation to happen because now you would ask them about Nico and they will ask you, what do you know? And then they will, you will share and they will add. So, you know, so I think for me, I was privileged. My uncle introduced me without me knowing two raps. He taught me, he told me, I read, I listened, and then I linked back to things I was ignoring, you know, mm -hmm. because I tried you know, to listen to more, but for me, culture and Nico links culture back to us. So people would want to associate their blackness with discarding anything Western. And so when you discard anything that is Western, you start to know who you are. You understand what, what, what rituals are done at your home. Now you're trying to bring that to your music. You're trying to bring that because you're trying to fight what's out there without your parents saying that anything, you know, by you being introduced to these ideas, you automatically would try to fight whatever influence that has crushed your own heritage. So I think Gavi also brings that up through Rastafarian, but Rastafarian not as the religion, it's uh, as a culture itself, but as artists who happen to share space with another community of different artists. So those influences come from different levels. And then young people go to school and then some who affiliate with black consciousness will learn more about these these, these, these leaders and these revolutionary people who left us with some wealth of resistance, they will learn through them via that. So, and so I think it's different and people who maybe buy a t-shirt, they will ask, where did you get this Gavi t-shirt? And then they will say, oh, you know, the, and then, so everything becomes a moment for education because some people put on things without reference. So sometimes they will meet someone who might understand and that is, is important, which is why the Black Power Station is important because it's a living history museum um, of people. So, so in a way that I think that's where the power is, you know, so um, that's what I wanted to, I think I can share. Mm -hmm. I don't know if yeah. that makes sense. Oh, you're making good sense, brother. Yeah, I'm loving it. Mm -hmm. Wow. So um, you mentioned other art forms. You mentioned theater, yeah. poetry. What else? How does it like if, if someone was to visit the Black Power Station and to observe what goes on, what would they see? If you come to the Black Power Station, let's say you're someone who likes to paint, an illustrator or visual artist, there's always a canvas for you to paint. So inside the Black Power Station, you would come, let's say there's an event, let's say you are performing and you wouldn't be only the only happening um, because what we're trying to do, because we're trying to represent everything at once, well, you would find people sketching while there's a live show of them. So those who are into drawing, they will be sitting with a canvas inside the Black Power Station painting so that we want to keep everyone inside. So those ones who are lovers of the book, there's a huge tree inside the Black Power Station that we turn to a, a bookshelf. So people will be grabbing books sitting while they're enjoying the show. So, and then you would find other people who are whatever art form, that is out there, people are more welcome to represent it. It's never reduced because there's a musician performing or there's a, a discussion on a book. Some other people could be sitting there appreciating 
the audio as a background noise while they be painting something. And then if your painting is so attractive to someone, they might buy it when you finish, when the show finishes. So there's that um, community of sharing, you know. So that's what you would get. You get that ambience of energies in one space. Some people, because we make it sure that every show is family orientated. So if you bring your children, you are there and they don't have to deal with smoke. They don't have to deal with anything that is gonna be making the kids feel uncomfortable. That you can bring, the kids will be painting, sitting on the floor. So it's always that home type of a feel moment. And you would also, as an artist coming to perform, you always made to read a book first before you start. So there will be always interrogating. There will be always people allowed 25 minutes or 30 minutes to interrogate the artist based on his music that he presents. So like an mm -hmm. interview, but not an interview, more a conversation to the artist. Mm -hmm. So an artist is, is not just gonna perform and get off stage. So the artist can right. actually have a literal conversation with the audience while mm -hmm. he's in charge of the performance. So at the Black Power Station, we give you life of an artist. So the artist mm -hmm. can feel that I'm not just here to, 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 I'm here to give life with my music. So, mm -hmm. you know, like, so it's, it's, it's that type of energy that we, we represent here. And this is not something that was written based on a proposal, how we want the Black Power Station to be but this is based on how reality and how the world is because people, they are people, they have different interests, but you can allow these different interests to come and build one bowl of energy that feeds everyone at the end of the day. So that's what you will find at the Black Power Station, you know? Ah, uh, I love it. You know, it, um, just that aspect of interviewing the artist after the show, I really like that because so many times, and we see this a lot in the West, in United States specifically, artists are not held accountable for what they say, mm -hmm. you know? And so having this sort of setup where the artist knows, okay, I'm gonna have to talk to the people now mm -hmm. and reason with them and give them solid reasons as to why I said this and why I present myself in such a manner yeah. holding them accountable to the community you know is something that I feel we as black people in the west now really need because so much of our, our entertainment our knowledge that is within the entertainment has been taken by the system by capitalism by business people by people who are outside of the community and made it into a product to be bought and sold whereby the artist is really he's just putting out a performance and he's not held accountable you know so that's really really positive something that we could benefit from I think definitely just yeah that yeah. aspect it's a it's a beautiful thing you know because the books we read you know the, I can say the majority also I can add on what people can find when they enter to the Black Power Station is different languages that people speak. And I think I might be wrong, but I said this before. Um, when I was in the US, I found that language is attached to politics. You know, um, hence it's easy for people to, no, language is attached to what the, the people who, the majority of the people who speak that language you know, is associated with people, you know, and their politics and how America relates to them. And then people, mm -hmm. when you say you speak Arabic, you related to a certain group of people who are, how this, how this is how they're related. So people will say, first, before I say I can speak this yeah. language, but I'm an American first. So, so meaning that you people need to announce that they are American. So the language they will speak, so that's my way of understanding. So if I say I'm an American, 
but I can speak Isikosa. It means that you're not denouncing your position from the, where you are in America and the politics that might be attached to Isikosa, which is the language I, I'm saying I can speak. So in a way that in the Black Power Station, you don't have to deal with that. Mm -hmm. Because we are growing up in a community that is speaking multi-languages. Mm -hmm. Still, the politics of the person can change. Mm -hmm. Even It doesn't mean they relate culturally or politically with the language they speak. It's a tool to communicate, mm -hmm. you know, and that communication also can mean that you respect those people's culture because language is also attached with how the language is crafted. You know, it, it links back to the people anyway, you know, whether you like it or not. Hence, I think it's, it was important to some people to announce that who they are first, I'm an American and I speak Arabic. American, I can speak German, you know? Mm -hmm. so, so, it, 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 so I think for me, at the Black Power Stage, you find variety of languages because we are in a town that is in the university space. You can find this is Sutu, Zulu, Tosa, Shangan. There's people from Zimbabwe who speak Shona. There's people from Nigeria who speak different languages. So in the room, but the most language that is spoken because the majority of the people come from the township which will speak Tosa more. So in the room, you find yourself learning a new language, which yeah. none of those languages are prayer. So if someone picks up a book and say, today, um, I felt I'm gonna read Zemkinko Mumat Kualandini, which is mostly poems in Isikosa and some, some Kosa clans and stuff like that. So that person will read that book without translating it. The next person, who wants to, other people say, sorry, I can't speak Tosa. What does that mean? It doesn't mean the person who was reading is oblig obliged to answer. Someone else can say, no, I know. And even how they would respond to that answer is entirely how politically those people associate themselves what was written. I mean, what was read to them. So meaning that the conversation now can start just from that book, because that's why we make it our culture to start reading a book before we start anything, because that book can held us accountable in the conversation. So that's why I think it's important to get the artist himself, when they come to the Black Power Station, when they're gonna perform or do whatever, they must bring a book. To us, mm -hmm. our highest currency to enter at the door is not your money, is paying with the book. Because a book is like land, it accumulates value as time goes. So whether the book is not well written, but in the future, that one line can inspire someone else to write something. So that's how we're treating books. You know, we, we're not treating them, okay. Yes, we want authors to write about Africa and for Africa, you know, but we take any other book, it can be a comic book. We can read a comic book. And then that one line you read, someone else can say, I have a problem with that book because it's saying this and this and this and this and this. And to me, I don't take lightly what that, whoever wrote that book says. And that people can have different opinions on that. So the Black Power Station beside performance, you would find that safe space for people to actually start a conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow, 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 wow. Yeah. What really stands out to me is your correlation between books and land, <laughs> an appreciable asset, you know, something that accumulates over time. And, you know, in the throes of capitalism, it's so hard for some of us to look beyond money. You know, there's a big movement among especially Black millennials in the United States where they're really deciphering the monetary system, learning about investment, the stock market, and um, 
making money, capitalism, the dollar bill is viewed as a tool of liberation. Yeah. But what you're saying is that there's something higher, you know, and that's the book, the knowledge, you know, and, and even it makes me think about something that Dr. Amos Wilson said, mm. talking about knowledge he was saying using the example of the Japanese yeah. after World War II how they were bombed to basically nothing they had to start their whole economy and everything back over again mm -hmm. but this is a, a small island where they didn't have a lot of land mm -hmm. they didn't have a lot of resources like oil or gold or anything they could sell to the outside world mm -hmm. all they really had was this and so they said okay let's let's take these certain things let's take the radios that are made by other other nations let's take the cars let's break them apart figure out how they make them let's copy them and then let's make them better mm. and so now even japan is viewed as a western power because they have so much economic uh power going on but they really have no resources still you know, they still a whole lot of people crowded on this little island, but they were able to make a way for themselves strictly because of their knowledge by observation, by learning and by building on that knowledge. So as you talk about accumulation, that makes me think of that, you know, and it's, it's so important. Yeah, because I think money is made off land, you know, so, so if you have land, then you can make the money. Hence, people will want to invest in property because it's on land. You know, you know, you can destroy like the story you just told me. They destroyed everything, but the land was there. It doesn't go anywhere. You mm -hmm. know, so can produce life to land, so you can mm -hmm. eat off land. So my mother used to say, um, "May your soul rest in peace." My mother used to say, "Money, imali, meaning that money is cooked food. Basically, money is cooked. When cooked food is cooked, what is gonna happen? You have to eat it, it finishes. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you don't eat it, 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 it something else happens to it. So yeah. if something which smells, you wanna eat it, there's a taste, it goes away. But land and people and stories, music, it stays in your memory, you know, like land, it stays, it has memory. We bury our people on land, plants grows on land, our houses stays on land. So it keeps everything, our secrets and everything. So money is a tool that makes these things on top of land. You know, we accumulate money on top of land and Without mm -hmm. land, we can't make money, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's why the, the bigger society and uh, the bigger industry, that's why they buy land in Africa, they buy land in other countries to start their businesses. So if young people want to be real entrepreneurs, they should start consider buying land, but not destroy and remove people for the sake of accumulating wealth because what happened, the land will remind them who the owners of the land by nature bringing storms and earthquakes and destroy whatever is there. And then things mm -hmm. will come out of earth and then this will be found or say, oh, you found this stone. It looks like 400 years ago, people used to live here. And then we'll say, no, you don't even have to use that 400 years history. Before they built that building, 50 years ago, people lived there. And those people moved to somewhere else. So in a way that land is a way of, you cannot hide anything. It is a way of exposing us to ourselves, you know? So mm -hmm. that we are one with land. We walk mm -hmm. on top of land, land protects us, land feeds us. So in a way that the books themselves come from land because trees are made out of, uh, of I mean, papers is made out of trees. I mean, you know, all these things, you know, so everything we should acknowledge the ancestor, which is land, 
you know, so which is the oldest ancestor of us is land, you know. So in a way that that's why we value it, you know. Um, you know, so that's that's what I think, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Powerful. Yeah, it makes me leads me to my next question and makes me think about um, land and ownership. You know, one of the big big differences I noticed. I've never been to South Africa, but I've spent a lot of time in places like Cameroon. Let's come to the Black Power Station. I'm I'm coming, brother. Hold my seat. <laughs> yeah, but I've I've been to mostly West Africa and a little bit in East Africa. But one thing that stood out that I noticed was in the United States, right? When you have land, you're always forced to prove to the system by either paying the taxes every year, having a deed, a title, that it's actually really yours, you know? Whereas in Africa now, I've noticed in the societies I've been to is that there is a concept of a community owning the land and through you being a part of the community, you have the birthright to the land. Yes. Whereas in the United States, I can buy all kind of land and be the richest man, but if I don't pay my taxes every year, they're gonna take that land away, and that's the end of the story, you know. Yeah. So, how does it work in South Africa with land and taxes and then that sort of thing? Uh, I can say part of the cities that same rule you just mentioned applies, oh. but in the rural settings, the land belongs to the king and to the people who indigenously occupy the land. Mm -hmm. And that part of that, the government, what the government is doing now, which there's a big fight now because people want their land back. And so what the government designed was to buy land back to the farmers who took the land from the black people. So mm -hmm. people are using the reference of them being on that land. Hence I said, land has memory because you find people say, there to prove you will find my great grandfather's grave is there. So mm -hmm. they use those things as proof. And some communities where they, they, the black people stayed and the missionaries came and built churches. And then there's a record of those people who lived there via the Christian documents. People are using those documents to claim the land back, but now the government buys back the land. So there's been huge fight of other people saying that we want the land without compensation. Mm -hmm. You know, so now in, in South Africa, there's that where in the rural space, people have land that themselves belongs to like what you're saying. If I come, let's say you're from the US, you get to that community, you say, I wanna be part of this community. I wanna be part of people who contribute in this community. I'm not gonna come here and be off the rules of the land. They can allow you to, to live in the land with the rules of the land that holds everyone accountable. Even me, if I'm related clan-wise to someone else, I can be grandfather, son of my father's or, or my mother's side of the family. I can be allowed to come construct a house as long as I abide by the rules of the land. Mm -hmm. So there is that communal space, but I must tell you, there's a move from other political organizations which I dismiss that idea of giving title deeds mm -hmm. to people living in those spaces because the danger of that, someone else who's not within the community and the understanding of the land in that space will sell that land to anyone who would come with the same attitude of the city and say, I live in this land. I bought this place. It's my property. I'll do what I want to do with it. I'll build a mall here. I'll build, uh, I'll build a liquor store, you know. Mm -hmm. So meaning that you cannot, the system changes. It means that the same rich people 
can go to those people who don't have those bags of money and buy off those land within a year. And the landscape, those people can be removed and come back to cities and add more people in squatter camps where people are staying in shacks and, and sitting in, in spaces where they squash together. You know, mm. you know, so in a way, I will send you a track I wrote with a friend of mine called Land Reform. You know, it speaks about this idea of land and how we view land. Uh, so mm. there is that two live, and we, I mean, two lifestyles of land and ideas that people are living with. So here in mm. South Africa, which mm. myself, I wanna go back to live in a rural space because my family comes, um, is 30 minutes away from Makanda. So mm. I'm going back where my father was born and there's mm. land there. I don't have to have a title deed. I don't have to prove everything. I just get there. I just come and say, I'm a son. I come from Dunyana. Mm. They will say, no, we can see the resemblance. We know your father. You can mm. build anywhere you want. So mm. I don't have that the title deed is mm. I'm off land, birthright mm. by yeah. my, you know, I don't need 13 digits, which is in our ID document, it's 13 digits. 13 digits don't, don't prove that I'm from the land. It's just a document to prove other people who are visitors to the land. Me, I'm off the land. My blood, my energies, my ancestors worship on this land. They know they have names of mountains, they have names of rivers, which all of those rivers names were changed. And then people mm. will have issues about this. If you, if there's nothing in a name, why change names of, of rivers? Why change names of mountains? Because that means you remove the history, you remove the connection of the significances of the land of the people to them. Mm. So they, mm -hmm. they become foreign to when, when they are told, you know, about, oh, there's a place called Fish River Sun It's like, what's fish river mm -hmm. and they will call it another name you know so so in things like that so i guess land is very important because of that besides mm -hmm. and it holds history mm -hmm. yeah. ah, so true you know it makes me think about um in the united states for example there's a lot of there's a lot of names of states of towns even rivers that are Native American names, but the people don't know, like Connecticut, Massachusetts, Manhattan, um, Chicago, Dakota, you know, so many, Mississippi, Tennessee, you know, and it's interesting how the history has been so erased, you know, that the people don't have that connection and don't really realize that they're actually saying that same word sound they're saying that same name that the place has had or at least has had a relationship to the indigenous people of the land but they don't know you know and that's that's something that has always i guess bothered me you know and then there are other places for example um i'm from virginia right and um as you travel in virginia there's a place called Black's Run. And Black's Run is like a, a, a creek or like a small river. But these areas, Black's Run, they got one called Mulatto Run, um, different runs. And these places were used as way stations on the uh, Underground Railroad. They were on that journey north, you know, to freedom during the slavery time. So when you see certain areas, like every time I see Blacks run, I'm going to say a little prayer because I know, you know, my ancestors were enslaved in Virginia. And so I know that that was a highway for freedom, you know. So you're right. The land is carries so much power either either way. It can be a power to keep you, um, I guess, if the oppressor come and name it something different, it can be a power to keep you enslaved and keep you ignorant. If it still holds that name, it can still 
inspire you. It just kind of depends, you know, it depends, but um, yeah, it's true. yeah, very powerful. And it, you know, like maybe because it gets deeper, the issue of land, which I don't have much politics about. Like for an example, the, the issue about Israel in Israel, about the land, you know, you know, if, if it then, if history was something that us as black people were always forced to forget. But the argument about the land there, they always wanna use biblical history, quoting Bibles, quoting Qurans to actually say why the land is theirs, why the land, they should be custodians of the land, why they should be custodian historically. You know, they want to quote to past and want that past to be present. Mm -hmm. They don't want to emerge. But for us, we always, these people who must forget. You know, mm -hmm. we must forget, we must not bring these things. We are past that, that's something that happened in the past. So mm -hmm. it, it makes us lose respect to ourselves and lose mm -hmm. respect to people before us. And I think mm -hmm. for me, people shouldn't fear to know who they are, where they come from because that gives them more confidence to understand the world. And you don't have to be angry to know that you were defeated. Africans were defeated, but there's some remnants that makes us powerful people mm -hmm. to add value to the world. We've mm -hmm. added to the world anyway before now. The reason that some other world have wealth is because of us. You see, so the land has been feeding people, our land. Mm -hmm. We are mm -hmm. considered a third world country, but actually there's no such thing, but it's because mm -hmm. mentally we are enslaved. How should we think about ourselves? You mm -hmm. know, and I think this is not a political question. This is reality. You mm -hmm. should know that you are off something. You come from a nation, nations yeah. actually, of great yeah. yeah. And those nations, because they are suppressed, doesn't mean they lost their greatness. They're mm -hmm. just waiting for the right leader to get out and not, and not make people to not accept their history. They must mm -hmm. accept the good and the bad. Mm -hmm. And then they will understand how to deal with the world. Like for myself, in my school, I never went to university, but I'm brave enough to stand in front of anyone to talk about myself, even speak English in many ways. I can break the language because it's not my language. Because if I, if I would conversate with anyone in my language, I'd be very fluent and that person would be able to not to communicate back to me, but because to show Africa was so colonized to the point that we're still powerful to give something to the world, you know? And I'm happy that I can communicate with other brothers of mine in another world to tell them we're still alive. You know, there's some place called home and there's a place for me called home where you are because mm -hmm. you can communicate. You know, I have friends or no lovely, David and other people, um, or AD, other people that I met in the US. So I have a different home. Yeah. Not because this is not my home, because people are travelers. There were no boundaries before. Hence, we allow people to come at our homes in Africa and took everything because we are people of hospitality. Mm -hmm. So in a way that I think the hospitality extend to kindness Beside mm. new food, we give you hospitality spiritually. We, mm. we, we don't want to fight. We rather mm. have another conversation in a different way. Fighting is mm. the last resolution. But mm -hmm. resolution, young people today, like in Black Panther, has been placed very strongly that we have allowed the West to actually take over we should be using our resources to fight the West. I think, I think it's never, we'll never, we'll never yield to anything. Our parents have seen so much blood. They've seen mm -hmm. so much murder. So I think mm -hmm. what's important is for people 
together and build from the ground up things mm-hmm. that they can control. Mm-hmm. Then when you build things you can control, then it's easy for you to determine where, how far they go. But if you mm-hmm. know things <clears throat> that are halfway baked for you, mm-hmm. you will still eat a half cooked chicken or whatever meal you be eating. It will be mm-hmm. not always juicy for you. It will never mm-hmm. be a nutrient for your body because mm-hmm. you can cook it. It's not cooked mm-hmm. well because it's served for you. So if you want to serve yourself and be a nourished body or mind, start it yourself. So the Black Power Station is that space that says everybody's welcome. But when, if you're welcome, the, the principle is clear. We should all be equal. And knowing that while we are equal, we have different qualities. You know, as humans, we are equal in terms of being human created, but with different skills. Our different skills still don't make us unequal. You might be a musician that plays an instrument, but you need someone else who's a sound man to make you sound better. You know, you might be someone who plays drums. You need someone, a vocalist to add vibrations of your energy through your music. You might be a great designer of things, but you need someone to utilize the instrument design. So in a way we're all equal because we ones who serve each other's interests. You develop, mm-hmm. I utilize mm-hmm. in my own liking. So in a way that the more us as the people who are growing up, young people, you need to understand, build from scratch. So you know the foundation, how deep it goes. So you know how you build your house. So you know the whole story of three pigs, you know, it's basically literally prepare for the, for the things you don't know, you know, prepare for the storm, prepare for, for anything that might come and destroy your life. A home can be your entire body, your mm-hmm. entire body. If your mind is not prepared to understand, to take over the world, the world would take over you. So mm-hmm. for me, I'm not trying to justify me not going further with my studies, but I've studied from the people around me. Mm-hmm. Uh, from my father, I studied from the elderly people, I studied from the culture I live up by. So now mm-hmm. I'm confident to learn more. Mm-hmm. School of mm-hmm. life is what mm-hmm. I graduate from. From having mm-hmm. this conversation, even I'm at school myself. Uh, wow, well, I'm definitely at school today. I'm thankful for your time. You know, um, we could go on, but I, I think this might be a good time to stop. I would like to, um, you know, just again, thank you so much for the wisdom that you shared with the audience and want to remind everyone Mm -hmm. to like, share and subscribe. We have been speaking with, blessed with the presence of the good brother X today from the Black Power Station. You can find them on Facebook at the Black Power Station or um, you said Around Hip Hop Live Cafe, is that correct? Yes. Sir. Okay. Do y'all have a YouTube channel? Yeah. Uh, well, it, it, it's also the Black Power Station. You On can, YouTube. Yeah. You just check there. It's called the Black Power Station. You can see one one episode we did of the story of Makanda. You will uh-huh. see it's called the Lost Conversation. It's mostly mm-hmm. in Tulsa. We deliberately didn't put subtitles, so mm-hmm. because we're trying to play around with this idea of saying even in the movie Black Panther, most people think the language spoken there, parts of Tosa, they think it's made up. Some of the African languages that are spoken there, they think are made up. The only language that is legit is English. So we felt that we're gonna leave no subtitles. Other people will imagine themselves what has been said there. But I speak Mm -hmm. Tosa. Like for example, people don't know even what language Mandela speak, he speak Tosa. But because when he speaks to the world, he speaks English. So he is mm-hmm. also, he speaks the language I speak. So in a way, um, I think part of the Black Power Station is try to say these indigenous knowledge systems 
that are within our language and cultures. We want to explore that and share to the world to say that there's a new way of educating people so that when they come to us, they would know how to deal with us. So when mm -hmm. we fight, say we don't do this, they could understand that this is because of this, not because mm -hmm. we're disrespecting you, it's because it's not beneficial to the community, but you can come with your culture, we can learn from it, but it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be part of what we do. You know, yes. so in a way that uh, I think I would say my goodbyes in Isikosa and then a little bit translate in between, maybe to stimulate people to learn more about the language. Um, um, we still go to a black power station. Sabule la kakul. September we did na banali kaya shalokuti. We tatin na kaya bani skangele. Kule mi kafazo si pete yo. Nisbo ane sinde sizenza. Bani funu ba tatin na kaya bano kasa. Sinde sizenza. Sinal mwenela olo kasolu. Basically, uh, it's been great having a conversation with you. I'm grateful for the time of each other, teaching each other. Because me having my ears, it's important for creation because when I speak, I'm hearing myself so that in the future, when these words are reminded, said back to me, my subconscious will be able to remind me of my own words so that whenever, whatever I've said that was good should be taken for that. So if it's said good back to me, I will swallow it. So that's why I must measure my words and to add and say, whoever wants to support and urge any kind of solidarity, we will be greatly appreciate. But we interested in your intention more than anything, because your intention will determine how far your support goes. Because if we just want to see you feel pity for us, please don't support us. Because at the end of the day, when we question you and your support, you will think that we are ungrateful to your support because we question your intention. So your intention is important because when you say I wanna support because of what you're doing is good, be part of the good so that you could see your support going far than just leaving some pocket of money and go because you would be interested what happens with the money. So you must understand the black power station is in a process of transforming the minds of young people across race, across colors so that Fixing a mind that is broken is a process. It's not based on funding. That has yeah. a limit, but it is a life process. So whatever support you want to give, you can look at us at the Black Power Station on the Facebook and also on our, on, on our YouTube channel. And, and thank you, brother, for allowing us to chat. And I'm looking forward for me and you to compose some music together. I can write my raps in Isikosa. And then you can send me some nice hooks outside. Actually, before I go, I wrote a song for my father when he passed away. Uh, it's called Dear Old Man. So what I can do, I can record some parts and then, and then you can finish it on that side and see how it comes out. Okay, beautiful. Before we go, can you just give us a minute of, of some rhyme? From, from the song? Okay. Yes. Okay, um, it starts with English. It says, Dear old man, is a slang on the shana, Zuzaban Zimundi Lingan, in the Safuni Kashan, the Tutiana Loboni San and Gizakai, Jing and Gulling with Nyanaka Chief, in the Lisekle, a Kagilego Semundwin. Okay, wait a minute, <laughs> I messed up there. Okay, I'll mm -hmm. do the second verse. I'll do the second verse. It says, my duty as a man is to listen and learn and be ready to implement the plan in the best way that I can. So I pray, old man, to reflect zonke imfundi so dinga kiingu na kanya kikani so di pepe tempiki so denze zlungi so apo kwenzwe zipo so ezingenzwang ngentro so zokunya shamangom so so I speak the truth. Jengo malumu alesta may so rest in peace. I write this. This is a city. Maklama tota mabini. Michael Hope Matindo. No alesta matekwan, bandi kulis and the same vekwan, bandu loose and I in dotan, dinguye lo nyan, oz misele u kulisa likai, the temanga temba umtal, kyove lukany, kamaku. Hmm. Push. <laughs>
so, yeah. so yeah, that's the second verse of the track. So I can re-record it and send it back to you. Then you can see how you can play with it. So I love it, my brother. I love it. Thank you so much. Grateful. Give thanks. Yes, sir. Peace. Yes, sir. We're gonna talk soon. I'll be uh, I'll be emailing you, okay? Okay, bless. Thank you. Bye. Peace, peace.